Thank you for joining us as Levi continues our study on the Book of Beginnings, the first book of Moses called Genesis. All right, let's pray. Let's get started. Lord Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you for this day. Pray that you would um, bless this evening as we go through your word, speak to us through your word. Pray for us to grow in you and stay strong. Thank you for this rain, and um, Lord, thank you for this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Tonight, we are going to be looking at Genesis 3, 7 through 13. So, I agree. Let's read this together, and then we'll break this down. Starting in verse 7. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings and they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden and the Lord God called to Adam and said to him where are you so he said I heard your voice in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself and he said who told you that you were naked have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Then the man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me of the tree, and I ate. And the Lord said to the woman, What is this that you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So let's look at this and break this down a little bit. Okay, so back at verses 7 and 8, give you an idea. Remember, they're in the garden. They've been given the command not to eat of which tree? Tree of knowledge of good and evil, right? And the serpent, which we talked about, there's a power of Satan behind him. This serpent comes and said, did God really say that you couldn't eat it? And remember what Eve does? She said, God said we can't even, not even that we should touch it, lest we die. But God said not to eat of it, for you will surely die. So she changed it. We talked about that. So now, we also talked about that Adam should have stopped the whole thing. He didn't stop the whole thing. He should have intervened immediately and was like, you behind me, Satan? No, he should have like, some of you don't even know that reference, do you? Wow. Oh, we got one. Good. So... Here we are now, where they realize what they've done, and their eyes are open, right? So again, verse 7 and 8 says, Then the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made for themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. They heard God walking in the cool of the day, all right? I like this art rendition, how they did it, God's presence coming into the garden. They hear it, and what do they do? They do this. They hid, and they had fig leaves. Now, quick question before we move forward a little bit. Who here has ever been around a fig tree? Who here has ever touched those leaves? They hurt. Prickly, prickly yes, very prickly. So think about this for a minute. This isn't them taking a fig leaf and touching with their hands. They are booty butt naked. And they are putting fig leaves in areas that are ultra sensitive. It hurts. Fig leaves by Louis Vuitton. All right. <laughs> the reality is they gained shame from sinning. And they knew that they were naked. They didn't know they were naked prior to this. And they knew. And there's two biblical theories on this one. There's one that they were actually naked and they just were so innocent they didn't realize they were naked because there was no sin. And another one is that they were clothed in light and therefore the light was removed and then they were naked and they knew they were naked. So how that is, I'm not too sure. It doesn't clarify if they were clothed in light, but it does show that at that time, the idea of being naked wasn't a problem to them. This is like the concept that if your dog one day looked at you and was like, put some clothes on me. Because he realizes, or she realizes she's naked. 
Dogs don't care. And like a little child, a little toddler, you can take them down to the beach and they can run butt naked through the beach and be like, hey, what's up? They don't care, right? <laughs> it's not till you hit a certain age, if you remember, you realize nudity is a problem. But prior to that, I mean, everywhere you went, you were like, hey, what's up, man? Like Isaiah back here, he's what? Two? A year and change. Okay? So if he ran around here naked, everyone would be like, oh my gosh, Isaiah's naked. He's so cute. Oh my gosh, look at that man. Right? If Darian whipped off his clothes here, walks in, he's like, hey guys, I'm ready for Bible study. We'd be like, yo, bro, first of all, please, please, all right? Ain't that kind of Bible study, all right? So, they gained shame, they knew that they were naked, and how does this connect to us? Well, it connects to us in this way, okay? Not only the fact, if you think about it, if there was no sin, I mean, it could be we'd be clothed in light. It could be that we would just be running around this planet with perfect temperature and all in our birthday suits. I have no idea. But what I'm saying to you, how this connects is this. Because of the choice they made, we now have the beginning of religion. That's the problem. See, God desires a what? A relationship with you. And mankind now begins religion. So they take a covering of their own guilt to approach God. They hear God and they run away from God. And they put this covering on them because they're afraid of their own shame. Does that sound familiar? I know the guilt I have. I know the choices I make. But I'm going to be religious so God will accept me and love me. Is that what his word said? No. He paid the penalty, so his blood covers us, that no shame can be on us, and no guilt. We're free by the price that was paid on Calvary. We're free. But we tried to do it by religion. All these religious works, right? So again, they cover themselves with fig leaves, and they're afraid to come near God. Why? Because God is holy. They knew they sinned. They knew they sinned. God is holy. They also knew that their works were not good enough. What was their works? Their works was, I'm going to go to this fig tree. I'm going to take the fig leaves. I'm going to put something together for me to wear. And I'm going to approach God. And they knew it wasn't good enough, so they hid. Have you ever done that in your life? And I ain't talking about literal fig leaves. I'm talking like, you ever go, well, I'm going to do it a little bit better this time. Lord, I know I messed up. I know I shouldn't have been in that place. I shouldn't have watched that stuff. I know I shouldn't have done that stuff. If you could just get me out of this situation, if you just get it so I don't pop on the urinalysis test because I know I just did a bunch of cocaine in this club, get me out of it. I, I promise I'll be at church on Sunday. I will tithe. I will give you 20%. We're negotiating with God. Does it work that way? No. No, it doesn't. And then God sometimes pours his grace on us that we actually don't get caught from the cocaine, which I know someone this happened to. He did this three times. And the fourth time, the Lord goes, enough's enough. And he wrecked his car, and he couldn't get out of it. And he actually popped, but it was the best thing that could ever happen to him. Miraculously, he kept his rank, but he got restricted to the barracks. And by being restricted to the barracks, guess who he ended up meeting? Yep. Me. And I had walked him through the Bible over and over and over until he gave his life to Christ. He realized the Lord wouldn't let him run anymore. Because the cocaine was taking over. And by the grace of God, see here's the real grace of God in this situation. By you getting caught popping for cocaine in the Marine Corps, what is the full punishment they can give you? Admin separation. Admin separation. You can lose all your stuff. You can lose your GI Bill. You can lose all your benefits. You can lose everything. And this guy, not only did he not lose his rank, they put him just in the barracks. He grew in Christ, he kept his GI Bill, he kept all his benefits, he kept his disability, and he grew in Christ. And he's actually married and has kids and he's doing really well. That's God's grace there. But the pain of being caught for the cocaine, he had a choice in it. He could have been like, this is not fair. No, he actually recognized that the Lord was like, I'm stopping you to save you. So... We have these situations like this where we do religious acts. It's not about religion because we all know we're not good enough about how our religious acts work. 
It's all about a relationship. Let's look at Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. The Epistle of Paul the Apostle to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 8 through 9. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. It says we're saved by grace, not of works, so that we cannot do what? Boast. Boast. You can't say I did it. Well, well, Lord, I'm here because I gave. I'm here because I gave everything away and I preached the gospel. Because there are people who can be in the church and can look ultra spiritual and they have no relationship with Jesus. Because everything they go through, there's no real relationship because they're always trying to appease God by doing something. And then they end up in the same sin and they beat themselves up over and over. And you have to understand it's a relationship with Jesus Christ that wipes out the addiction. By the Holy Spirit residing in you, he cleans you so therefore you're free. When you try to do it by religion and you negotiate, nothing's going to happen. Nothing's going to happen. Who's done that before? We've all done it. And we tell ourselves, I'm never going to do this again, I promise. I will never do this again. To find 48 hours later, what do we do? We're back at it. It's bad. Now, here's the thing. Man's religious system begins in the garden. Understand that. It began in the garden. They died instantly spiritually, but the spiritual life of walking with God is a relationship. So they were walking every day. Remember the lie that Lucifer gave them, the lie that they got from this. That they would be like God, that they would never die, and they would know what God knew. Ladies and gentlemen, they already had it. They were created in the image of God. They were eternal. They were never going to die. And they walked God every day. They could have asked them any question about anything and got the answer. It was a relationship, not a religious system. So when you try to do the works to please God, guess what you're doing? You're blaspheming. It's a form of blasphemy. You're trying to appease God, and you can't. It becomes extremely difficult, and you begin to blaspheme. Again, I want you guys, just from these two verses, to realize this, that it's so important that you have a walk with Jesus, not a religious thing. Don't do religious practices. Talk to Him. And, and, and a way you can look at this is, he compares it so much to a walk with a husband and wife. It's a real practice of relationship, of talking And spending time and intimacy and and goofing around and being funny. And it's not a religious practice. You know, it's about knowing the individual. And that's what the Lord wants. He wants this deep relationship with you that you walk with him. And the enemy hates the fact that you would have a relationship with him. Because the minute you have a relationship with him through the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're free. You're a free person. The chains of this world don't hold you anymore. And the addictions begin to melt away. And you can actually say no to the enemy and to the flesh. So let's look at verse 9. In verse 9 it says, Then the Lord God called to Adam and said to him, Where are you? Where are you? Now, there's a few things to look at in this verse. Satan, first of all, always wants to destroy the image of God and who he is. I want you to remember that. Satan wants to destroy the image of God and who he is. This is what Satan wants to do. He wants you to think that God is a cruel master, an angry father, and a God that's just waiting for you to make a mess to tell you how dumb you are, how stupid you are. And you know the sad part is? Many people in the church believe that. But they practice religion. And that's not how God is. It's not how he is. The Bible says... In Proverbs, that God corrects those whom he loves. Just like you would correct a child. So when he says here, in verse 9, and he's saying to them, where are you? He's not going, hey, where are you? You get out of here right now, boy. Come here, boy. (laughs) That's not what he's doing. Okay? He is actually, the Lord here, is asking, where are you? Like a dad that's hurt. Where are you? Because he can't find his kids anymore. And some of you parents know this. Some of you know the pain of when your kid goes the other way and you're just like, come on, where are you? It's not easy. He's not yelling at them. He's calling to them. 
Now, here's the thing. I want you to really think about this. Do you realize that God calls you that way too? Hey, where are you? You know why? Because he loves you. Where are you? Constantly. Where are you? When he wants devotional time with you, where are you? When he wants to have time of prayer, where are you? When you're quiet and you're thinking, man, I think I want to do, like, watch TV, where are you? It's the enemy that comes and makes it so you don't hear. He constantly calls to you, where are you? And it's out of love. He wants to have a relationship with you. The Lord is calling us when we are lost. And the Lord calls to us to walk with him. And the Lord calls to us when we run away. We've all been there. We were all lost at one point. And he called. Some of us were searching. I want something better. I'm tired of my sin. And he calls. Some of us, as we walk, he calls. Because he wants to show us things. He's like, come over here. Come over here. Look at this. And then some of us have run away. And he goes, where are you? Because he calls to you. If you're running, stop running. His call will get stronger and stronger. You can't run away. He will only come after you faster. Because he loves you. Yes. I agree with all what you're saying. Do you not also think that he knew where they were? He wasn't yelling or being disrespectful to them, but he was calling to them and they were hiding. So it was like he was calling out their sin, right? Or not? No, he was calling to find out where they are. He knew where they were, but it's like this. It's like when the kid is hiding, knowing I did something wrong. You already know he did something wrong. You know your kid, right? Whether a teenager or little or preteen, even an adult, you know your kid. Like, I, my daughter, when, when she kind of did something wrong, I could tell the way she holds herself, like, okay, what'd you do? I already know. And I've learned that being a pastor here, I can look at certain people here that I work with, and I can look at them and be like, you didn't read, did you? You're not talking to the Lord, are you? And there's times that the Lord shows me that. And I'm telling you, he's going to deal with their sin in a minute. As a dad, he's more concerned. It's like, think of this. When, when that child messes up for y'all who have children, are you more concerned about correcting that they have the punishment or that something got broken in your relationship? Broken in the relationship. But if you're a good dad, you know I, gotta, I can't just let it go. And even the times where maybe you as a dad or you as a mom or your parents or whoever is your guardian goes, okay, you know what? I'm going to let that one go. Are they really letting it go? No, what are they doing? They're taking the penalty on themselves. Think about it. Kid messes up and they let it slide. If the parent really has love, like Jesus does, it's not just like, ah, what's the big deal? It's like, okay, and I'm taking that penalty on me. Because as parents, if we could, we would take all the penalties on ourselves for our kids. But we realize our kids have to learn the lessons. And as adults, it becomes worse because I'm learning this now as a, having a 20-year-old son and an 18-year-old daughter where when they make certain choices, you have to be like, okay. One of the biggest things I had to learn was like uh, my little girl. My daughter, you mess with her, I will mess with you. Simple as that for anyone who has a daughter. And so she works at this place and she was having a hard time and she for the first time actually got reprimanded. It wasn't crazy. It wasn't bad. It wasn't insulting. It was justified. But she never had someone that was like a boss correct her. And it wasn't like Marine Corps style, nothing like that. But she never had that before and it caught her off guard. So she had such a hard time. She was like, I think I'm just going to quit. I'm just going to quit. And guess what dad did? No, you're not. You are not quitting. You're going to go back in there. You're going to realize this is how things go. You're going to recognize your boss had to correct you. They correct. And you move forward. Did your boss yell at you? No. Did your boss call you names? No. Did your boss berate you and belittle you or put you on display? No. What did they do? Pull you on the side talk to you? Then they did it right. 
I had to realize as dad, I couldn't rescue her. I couldn't go in and rescue her. I had to let her figure out how to fight that one. Now, had her boss called her names and went crazy on her, you, you bet in a heartbeat I'd probably be over there. But she had to learn this. And she learned it well. She learned to handle it. And so the Lord is doing this thing here. He's going he's gonna to have to correct it, but you got to understand, the Lord corrects it because He's just. Because He has to. He doesn't want any of us to have to go to hell. He's calling. And every time He calls it the divine appointment, and you know that God is still calling to you? Every day? You just have to answer. Every day. He wants a relationship with you. Even when you mess up. And it's Satan. Satan's the one who accuses. Romans tells us, Therefore there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus who walk according to the Spirit, not according to the flesh. It's Satan who's the accuser of the brethren. That's what Revelation tells us. So Satan's the one that's like, Come on, man. It's great. Give it a try. You'll love it. And we do it, and he's like, loser. You're such a loser for following me. And then we sit there and be like, see, God doesn't want us. And then we want to go to the Lord, and he's like, he doesn't want you. He doesn't want you. You messed up again. But that's not how the Holy Spirit works. That's how the enemy works. Yes. I love how, like, even in my point, how the Lord spoke to him and said, where are you? Even then he wasn't condemning them. Mm -hmm. Knowing that they had just sinned, He's not like, I don't even, I can't believe you guys did that. It was a little worried because he had just straight up just left his presence. He stepped away from the Lord and tried to cover themselves. You know, it's like broken relationship with God, that transparency, that intimacy was just hindered him. And, you know, you don't see the Lord coming and being like, like, you know, fire, like right there, you know, it's consuming him. No, this is great. <laughs> And he knows the outcome. So let's look at this. Verse 10 through 11. This is Adam. I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat? Okay, so they learned what is to be evil. And Adam and Eve stepped through a one-way door, taking all of mankind, and there was no going back. It's a one-way door. So guess what, ladies and gentlemen? There's hope in this. Because guess who stepped through that door and showed us that we can come back? Jesus. Jesus stepped in through that one-way door, and he brought us back. So you just need to step through the narrow gate and follow Jesus, and God will begin to work in you. He already loves you because he sent his son to die for you. He paid the penalty for it all. And God here begins to question Adam to draw him out. This is where kind of what John was bringing up about the sin. He begins to question to draw him out because God does this with us. He questions us so that he can draw out what's really happening in our life, this interrogation. Again, you've had this happen to you, whether you're in the military, whether you're a parent, anything. You know these questions. I, I used to do it to my guys all the time. I'd always have a junior Marine that was late, and I'd be like, you were late? Yeah, I was late. Why were you late? Well, you know, you see this thing and that thing and that. I'm like, oh, okay. So, like, where was that on? What, what highway? Where, where? What time? And who here has ever been late and told your, your platoon sergeant you had a flat tire? What do they usually do? Hey, let me see that spare. You got the spare on there? You know how to ask those questions, all right? And, and the Lord does this in this way to see where we are. God does this to get the truth and to deal with the sin. So the part of where they are is seeking and love. The part of starting to question what you're doing is to pull it out so he can deal with it. All right? He's searching for you and every day. So as you read your word, that call, where are you? Where are you? Where are you? Sit down and read the word. And then you begin to read the word. And guess what happens? It becomes alive because it says active and living. And then all of a sudden, verses come alive and it deals with what's inside you. And you're like, oh man, I really got to change that. I really got to do something about that. I'm going to take a little side road here real quick with you guys. The Bible tells us about, and Timothy, about those who want to teach or held a certain accountability. And for those who want to be pastors and how the enemy attacks. When I was first coming on to be a pastor, I remember I was getting close to being ordained. And uh, Satan was attacking me more and more in my sleep. To the point... One time, I felt something even grab me. 
But I mean, it was nasty attacks. And I remember that the enemy attacked me one night really bad. And I felt the power of the Holy Spirit come upon me to stop it. And it's the one time in my walk with Christ, I heard the Trinity speak as three different persons. That God, the Trinity spoke. When they spoke to me, I heard the Father say, you must be holy as I am holy. And then I, I felt Jesus say, I paid the penalty so you can be holy. And I heard the Holy Spirit go, I will make you holy by my power. And then the attack stopped. It's not fun. We do, each pastor gets attacked differently. Raul Reese, uh, he gets attacked different. I don't know if you know his story, but he gets seizures in his brain. And it's not where he falls on the floor, but it causes um, paralysis. Where he'll be in the middle of teaching, and then he'll just stop and stare. And he can't come out of it till it's over. And it will last for like five minutes or three minutes. And it actually induced um, a flashback of Vietnam where he thought the Viet Cong was outside his office. Because he was a Marine in Vietnam. So just pray for us. Pray for the pastors. Pray for me. And I appreciate you guys praying. And, you know, it just it shows how human we are. But it's not. I hate it. I hate it. It's absolutely awful. So, thank you. But shall we continue? All right. So verse 12. So God asked him if he ate from the tree. So Adam says to God, forgive me, Lord God. I have sinned. Forgive me. Put it all on me. It has nothing to do with her. I should have stopped it. I saw what was happening. This is all my fault. Don't, don't blame her. I take full responsibility. Oh, it doesn't say that? No. Oh. Um, <laughs> So, it actually says, <laughs> it says, then the man said, listen very carefully what he says. Then the man says, the woman, the woman whom you gave me to be with me, she gave me of the tree and I ate. And then in verse 13, and the Lord said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. So look at this picture. All right, if you can read, it says, it was the woman. It was a serpent. Oh, I see what's going on. Fine. <laughs> look at his arms. <laughs> and then after Adam Eve died, this is her tombstone. He said, at least my wife couldn't complain that I never listened to her. And Evro, I married what used to be a perfect man. <laughs> so, the blame gang begins. Adam blames Eve. Eve blames the serpent. Now, listen very carefully how Adam does this. It's my wife, my wife, my wife. She messed up. This woman, you gave me. Who's he actually blaming? God. God. Because before it was my wife. When Eve shows up on the scene back in chapter 2, he's like, Thank you, Lord. She's a hottie. <laughs> That's basically what he said. This is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. This is my wife. Yes, right? She messes up and it's like, The woman whom you gave me. This is your fault. Because you gave her to me. You knew she was like this. It's your fault. No, he actually should have took responsibility and they start blaming around. In this whole thing tonight, remember, God is calling to you every day. And if you have sinned and you have messed yourself up, he just wants to deal with the sin. So what should you do? Repent. Repent. Come to him and be like, yeah, I blew it. I messed up. And you may be like, wait a minute, what do you mean I've sinned? Yes, we've all sinned. I haven't done anything really bad lately. I've been reading the word. I haven't been watching anything inappropriate. I haven't been listening to crazy music. I haven't even cussed in three months. What are you talking about? Did God tell you to do something? Yes or no? Did you trust him in it? Yes or no? For you who in your mind just went, no, that's sin. If God said do and you said no, guess what that is? That's called disobedience. That's sin. That's sin. If the Lord is speaking to you through his word, apply it to your heart so you can walk with him every day. So you can get strong every day in him. And if you feel weak in it, then he will set you free. Just ask him. It doesn't matter what it is. Just ask him and he'll set you free. 
He will fight the battle for you. You just got to let him. A lot of times we just don't let him. We want to do it ourselves. You know, one of the things about working with the military is they have the hardest time letting the Lord do things. I either mean they fully trust or they fully don't. They're either like objective orders. Yes, I get it. We go fine. Or it's like, why? 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 And then the idea of getting help bothers. I met many military like that. It's not just the military, but it's like, here. I'm going to help you. No, no, I got it. I got it. I had a friend that had to learn this. I give him gas cards and he'd be like, okay, I'm going to find someone who needs it. No, they're for you, buddy. Learn to take them because if you don't learn to receive things from people, do you think you'll ever receive from the Lord? No, you won't. You will not. It's not by your might nor by your power. It's all by what Jesus can do and what he's doing through you by the Holy Spirit. What you need to understand is this. If you learn nothing else tonight, God is chasing you down and calling you every day. God wants to deal with your sin every day and help you to be strong like him. And it is not your job to shift the blame. Just repent and say you're sorry and you'll be free. You mean it's that easy? Yep. It's that easy. Is it easy? No. Do we like it when we're wrong? No. We get corrected and it's like, uh. <laughs> you could be having the best day. You could be driving home and be like, oh, it's great. Man, it was perfect. PT got canceled. We got let out at noon. It's a great day. And you get one correction and it's like, my day sucks. <laughs> You know why? Because guess what we actually think in our mind when we get corrected? Nope. How dare you judge me? You don't even know what I've been through. And you know what the crazy part is? We say this to God. God, you don't even know what I've been through. You don't even understand what I've been going through. Like, please. He sees it all. I mean, I, I wonder sometimes what his face is like when we tell him that. You don't get it, Lord. I wonder if he's just like, hey, Michael, come here. Look. Another one that says, I don't get it. <laughs> you really believe God doesn't get it? You really believe God doesn't understand what you go through? He made you. He knew you in the womb. He formed you in the womb. No, he did not slap you in the womb. All right. Yes, he created you. He knows your character. He built your character. He has a plan for your life. The thing is, are you fighting against this plan? That's the real question you got to ask. He knew Adam and Eve. He knew what was going to happen. And this brings the whole question, then why did he put the tree there? Free will. As obedience. Because the thing is, it goes back to like a marriage proposal. Gentlemen, when you propose to the girl you love, do you want her to say yes because she loves you? Or because you have a 45 to her temple and she's going to tell you whatever you want to hear? You could take a gun to a girl's head, put it there, be like, will you marry me? Yes. Do you want to have it on planet Mars? Absolutely. We'll have it on planet Mars. Because she wants to stay alive. Or you propose to her and she loves you and she says yes. One guy asked me and goes, well, if God already knew, why did he do it? And I said, let me ask you a question. I told the gentleman. I said, this is on Camp Pendleton. I said, are you married? He said, yes. I said, so did you do the whole proposal thing where you got down on one knee and showed the ring and everything? He said, yeah. Did you already know your wife was going to say yes? And he goes, okay, I get it. Even though he knew his wife wanted to marry him, she was already going to say yes. He, did, he went through the whole motion of going down on one knee, opening the box, presenting the ring, asking, will you marry me? Because he wanted it to be special for who? For her. You don't think God wants things to be special for you? Yes. He already knows your needs. He already knows your wants. He just wants you to ask. Because he wants to have the relationship of a conversation. He wants to deal with your sin. And he wants, and not to squash you like a bug, but so he can clean you out so it goes away and it doesn't conquer your life anymore. Amen? Let's pray. Lord God, thank you for this evening. Uh, thank you for your word. Lord, it's been a, a very strange evening. Lord, thank you for protecting us. And Lord, I just thank you for all that you're doing. Uh, pray for each one here as they go home, they would think about this. Lord, that they would allow you 
they would trust you and allow you to just come in and deal with their sin, that they would grow each day in you and trust what you're doing and the plans that you're doing and moving things forward. And Lord, I just thank you for this place and all the plans you have for 2020. Lord, thank you for getting us through 2019. Uh, next week as we get together as fellowship and just a good time of food and, and just uh, before we take the break, Lord, I pray that um, first I want to thank you that we've all come together. I want to thank you what you've done with this place. I want to thank you for all the new people here that are growing in you, Lord, and all the people who have uh, been coming here for the years. Lord, I pray for our health, pray for our marriages, our children, our relationships. And Lord, I pray that we would be strong in you. Lord, I pray for unity. And Lord, thank you for, for just loving us. Lord, we bless you. We love you. You are the great shepherd that will come back soon. And Lord, we pray you come quickly. 